family of cave people live by simple rules. At any sign of danger, retreat to the cave. Headed by Grug, he's the lead of the family, the patriarch. And one day, a stranger comes into the mix and their cave is compromised. Cage stars in his fifth animated outing in 2013's The Croods. I'm joined by story artist, cartoonist and animator David Trumbull. How are you, David? Hey, man. A little bit about yourself before we dive into this film, David. So, um, yeah, how did you get started in the world of animation? Oh, well, it was a, a crazy sort of like moonshot, actually, because there's no, I mean, any any person in, in animation will tell you there's no one road to get into that industry. And I'd started life as, as an illustrator and a cartoonist, and, and I'd gone to film school. So I had like a foundation of filmmaking uh, under my belt, uh, but it was all in sort of independent short films and things. And then I'd had a long period in my 20s of being a uh, freelance artist. So it was another word for being that I was destitute, you know what I mean, for, <laughs> for a long period of time. And then um, uh, I, I, I uh, had this, 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 this moment where uh, I was working for a lot of people in the United States, freelance, uh, remotely. Um, and so uh, uh, my girlfriend uh, said, you should, she's American, and she said, you should try and uh, apply for your dream job, which is which is to go work at Pixar. So I, um, I was like, well, that's never going to work, but I'll give it a shot. And uh, I, I sent my portfolio in, uh, but my portfolio didn't have any story work in it, didn't have any uh, uh, actual animation stuff. It was just my, my freelance artwork. And so I didn't get into Pixar, but there was this weird mixed message um, from the, the head of the internship uh, uh, which uh, gave me this feeling that perhaps he'd seen something in my work because he'd asked to see some more, but then had told me that they filled all the positions. And so my girlfriend said, look, you've already gotten a visa to come to America to yeah. potentially come work at, at, uh, at, at Pixar. So, you know, you and I have been talking about like you coming to America and, and you know, trying and shooting for your dream here. And and so it was kind of like I, I, I took a, like a, a leap of faith both in terms of my career, but also in terms of that relationship, you know, which is, we're still together now. <laughs> and, um, and uh, so, so it worked out pretty, pretty amazingly. But I, I went to this guy's masterclass in New York and he recognized my portfolio. And uh, even though I didn't get into Pixar, this 20 year veteran of Pixar ended up getting me a job on my first animated movie. Uh, and we've worked on several pitches for different movies together. And now I'm a full-time story artist uh, working uh, on animated movies. It's crazy. That's amazing. So, uh, yeah, do you mind if I ask, what was that first, that first film that you worked on? That first film was uh, what would eventually become the movie Ugly Dolls, which was released last year uh, by SDX. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think I mentioned a little bit off mic, but the, the version of Ugly Dolls that I first worked on back when it was being made by Robert Rodriguez was a, a massively different movie. <laughs> um, uh, there was like, you know, uh, uh, it, it's some of it's in my portfolio and stuff like that, but there was like a post-apocalyptic wasteland. There was <laughs> lots of like giant cockroaches and scorp scorpions and fungus. It was like, it was mad and totally Rodriguez. And then as happens a lot in animation, like different directors, uh, you know, uh, come in like uh, the story gets gets changed uh, ad nauseum and stuff but uh, um, even though that movie kind of came out in a very sort of like uh, underwhelming way it was kind of like uh, considered kind of a generic uh, commercialized sort of product based movie you yeah. know it was like trying to hit that trolls market trying to really sort of sell some product and the audience was kind of wise to it even though it kind of didn't really make a big splash it taught me so much about filmmaking so much about the filmmaking process and I'm always going to have like a special place in my heart for it. <laughs> um, one of your previous guests, Liam H. Dempsey, yes. uh, fantastic guy, loved the, the Bangkok Dangerous episode. He texted me once after Ugly Dolls got its much belated release in the UK. He was like, he messaged me going, oh, mate, I'm sat in the cinema watching Ugly Dolls. I'm the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, but like, God, you got to love him. That, that's, that's a loyalty. Yeah, at least there's like a soft launch out of the gate, right? Like if uh, in the way of like films to be working on, like, I guess, I don't know, the pressure's mounted high when you've got like Robert Rodriguez. I don't know. I imagine if you'd worked on like, if you'd got that dream job at Pixar and like say your, mm -hmm. fir your first like feature was, I don't know. Toy Story 4 or yeah, something. Yeah, Toy Story 4. <laughs> then, it's, then, then you're pressure. kind of, you have that pressure of like, uh, the Arctic Monkeys of like, how can we live up to that first album? Like, do you have that yeah. feeling just lo looming over you the, the, the whole time? Um, 
yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Like, it's crazy to think like someone like me, I, I can't think how would you even go about like contacting someone like Pixar? Like, how does that work? Is it just like, is there, is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's crazy. I mean, like, um, especially when you consider that the story department, which is my my role, like we do the yeah. storyboards and and we pitch to the director and we help with the writing of the story. It's called story artist rather than storyboard artist for the reason that we have a massive impact on what becomes the finished script. Like script pages then can can sometimes be written based upon an idea presented in a story pitch. So it's like actually it's like it, it's a, it's a real. Uh, privileged position to be in in the movie because you could be part of a movie where you're not the director and you'll never ever get like um, like credited for it but but you'll see something on the finished product in the cinema that you know came from you and so it's kind of humbling because it's like you get all the power followed by none of the power and and uh, and so it's it's kind of like the front lines of storytelling in the movie and, and you end up with this beautiful sort of like uh, push pull between your desire to sort of progress further and become a director because a lot of story artists um, uh, uh, end up becoming directors in the animation industry but at the same time uh, one story artist uh, from DreamWorks this fantastic story artist called Sharon Bridgman who's worked on so many amazing projects said like you know obviously everyone wants to develop their own piece or everyone wants to move up but at the same time like I'm already in my dream job and so I, I, I consider myself incredibly lucky because it's, it's kind of like a beg, steal or borrow. Like you do whatever you can to, to, to get your foot in the door. But once you get in to this job, a story artist, like I'd be happy if I continued just at the level I'm at, you know, right. because it's, it's, it's magic. Amazing. Well, you mentioned DreamWorks. Obviously DreamWorks released The Croods. Um, yes, so it did. What like um from from just an animation standpoint, like what what is your kind of takeaway from this film? Like, um, okay, so so this movie, I think in order to properly review it with you, mate, um, we're gonna have to give it two reviews. We're gonna review it as a movie, yep, and we're gonna review it as a Nicolas Cage movie. Yes, because... that is that is as these always always happen. <laughs> because correct me if I'm wrong, this was. What was it? 2013. This movie came yeah. out. This is uh, during uh, Cage's downturn, right? So, so as a Nicolas Cage movie, it's pretty bloody good, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Well, well, yeah. And for like an animated feature that he's done, this is one that actually he is up front and center. Like, yeah, he is. He gets to kind of show you like all of his kind of range and like he really gets to work with his voice and like whether it's like just the the speaking parts or even just things he could do with his voice because this, this is a very physical movie so there's a lot of like him kind of grunting and like howling and screeching and yeah. doing war cries yeah it's brilliant so so you get like for yeah i think of all the animated films he's worked up to till this to this day like this is this is the best like performance from cage a lot of them whether it's astro boy it's just quite again he doesn't really get time to shine because he is very underused in that film yeah and yeah like and maybe cast in a role that doesn't lend itself to why you get nicker cages in <laughs> you know, like it's just it doesn't make sense to put him in a position where he can't cut loose otherwise you know because people these days audiences he's like jeff goldblum he's become his own kind of a meme yes. And so it's like Jeff Goldblum used to be in movies like The Fly as an actor, and now he goes into movies as this is Jeff Goldblum in a movie. This is yes. Jeff Goldblum in space. This is Jeff Goldblum doing this. And so um, uh, there's a, a, a quote from the, the makers of uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is obviously Nicolas Cage's, one of his more successful, very yeah, yeah. animated voices. And there was a moment in the, um, in the recording where they were trying to get him to, to go a little bigger, um, with his part playing uh, Spider-Man Noir and Cage turns to him and said, oh, okay, so you want the full Cage, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and, and they were like, yes, absolutely, we want the full Cage. And that actually represents, in a weird way, like a strange tipping point for Cage in this era that starts with the Croods, which is, when you think about it, like he hit it massive in the 90s. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I was introduced to him by the sort of triple whammy of The Rock, Face Off and Con Air. And that was back when he was like, could do no wrong. And then there was like this sort of wilderness period where suddenly he started doing things where it was like, okay, I saw him in, uh, <laughs> I actually went to see the Wicker Man remake in the cinema. Fantastic. And that was the, it was the first time I'd ever seen him and was like, 
okay, that's objectively not a good performance. Like that's not a, that's not a great <laughs> film. Um, uh, that's not just, he's an acquired taste. He did not do a good job in that role. Um, and, and so suddenly I was like, okay, but my, my estimation of him went downhill. But now we're in this period where weirdly, he's come back around the other side because the people who were kids or teenagers in the 90s who loved The Full Cage yeah, yeah. are now the people making the movies. <laughs> so it's weirdly that now when you get Nicolas Cage into a movie, it's full of, like, like the people hiring him are the people who are like his biggest fans, who want him to go and be himself. So you get something like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse where they're like saying, go for Cage. And then you also get like um, him showing up in uh, Teen Titans uh, yeah. as Superman, as a referential nod to the fact that he was all, almost Superman. It's the, the geek deep cuts. It's the fan service. And now Cage has become fan service well, and so it's like a new renaissance for him to be nick cage in a movie well it's this thing as well like i often think about it that he is like one of the only actors who in essence has played superman spider-man <laughs> and you could argue batman yeah role kick in, ass. in kick ass yeah which is that was like, a great episode by the way thank you yeah so so that like he has he's got the trifecta of just kind of like marquee super uh su like superhero names yeah. And, um, <laughs> but yeah to your point of like all of the like directors like now who are like casting him and like getting him in their stuff in fans for him i think like one of the things we see as well and the, the the analogy i like to use is um he may play like guy seeking revenge like mm. over and over again but mm. like he kind of has this like palette of like colors and like paints that he can draw upon where we're getting to see different shades of the same red whether that may be like a uh, vengeance a love story where it's mm. kind of like quite straight like man seeks vengeance or we yeah. get him in like mandy where we get art house like mm. real rage cage but with this kind of artistic flair and like they all just harness this kind of essence that is yeah, Nicolas Cage. Well, he's not afraid to way. go for it. You know what I mean? Like, it's 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 funny that you mention that because you're absolutely right that the Croods absolutely lends itself and is tailored yeah. to what his strengths are as an actor. Because um, so uh, if you go as far back as his fantastic performance in uh, Raising Arizona, yeah, um, he actually said that when the Coen brothers pitched him that character, he was like, I'm going to play him like he's a human cartoon character. <laughs> and so that's why he has what is it the the roadrunner on his or like the, 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 there's a, a famous yeah, yeah. character on his tattoo on his arm uh or his leg i can't remember which one but but um he plays that like a real cartoon and it's it's a, it's a performance that should not work but absolutely does and so putting him in an animated movie should be like a no-brainer because he's already portraying cartoon characters on film so putting him into animation is like a perfect marriage of medium and subject. Well, yeah, I listened to an interview recently, like in regards to you saying about the uh, the directors asking for full cage on uh, Into the Spider Verse. Um, he's like famously known to ask, like, can I just have one take for me, please? Like, and that's when you know, that's when you know that you're gonna get like, you're gonna get cage. You're gonna get like. And like most directors have said, like, well, of course, that's the one we use because yeah. <laughs> that's when he's giving us like what he wants and he's allowed to like go for it. Um, which, yeah, I've, I've got a clip of him actually talking about his performance in amazing in this film. So I'll just quickly run that. Cool. Run me. Austrophobic sitting in that little aquarium with a microphone. Uh, you got to get relaxed so you can perform. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I had two very talented and original, uh, hilarious filmmakers in Chris and Kirk. They loved it when I would go completely, you know, off base to the moon with some pretty outrageous dialogue or behavior. They they encouraged it. There we go. That's that. That's Cage talking about his his performance in this film and the directors again willing him to go to those crazy places 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's awesome. The, the, the two directors that he's talking about are uh, Kirk D'Amico, who was a writer on the project for a long period and then was upgraded to a co-director yeah. um, as it went through a series of different uh, iterations. And the director, Chris Sanders, who uh, is a veteran of Disney. Um, uh, he worked on The Lion King. He worked on oh, Beauty and the Beast. And uh, as a story guy, and, and he's had various roles, but he was a co-director of Lilo and Stitch. And in fact, the voice of Stitch. So this guy knows what it's like <laughs> to go full cage, as it were. Like, like this guy knows the benefits of, of uh, improvisation. He knows the benefits of, of letting someone create a character. And then um, he also worked on, uh, with the same, with his Lilo and Stitch co-director, Dean Dubois, um, uh, he worked on How to Train Your Dragon as well. So this is like a guy who doesn't just make like your average fair. He's, he's always pushing to try to create something a bit more unique and uh, a, a bit more uh, stylized. Yeah, all of all of those like are fantastic. Like How to Train Your Dragon, just like, and one of the things that that has, and I think shares like with this film, is it has a lot of heart. Like um, mm -hmm. this is probably like the first time on the Caged In podcast where I have watched uh, a Nicolas Cage film and... Uh, nearly cried uh yeah i mean like i was gonna ask like right off the bat what did you think of this film as someone really, who's been watching all the cage you know i really enjoyed it um I, it's just kind of a two-pronged thing for me uh i am uh yeah i have a one-year-old son so like that probably plays like quite heavily into like oh, wow. the, the themes of this film and kind of like a father trying to protect his family at mm -hmm. like whatever whatever odds it may be <laughs> um, so there has been like throughout yeah throughout the last year there's been many many films that uh shouldn't affect me that probably do i think anything with this kind of uh arc in it of a father <laughs> a daughter, father. father son like relationship will kind of like get me uh one in the bag <laughs> oh yeah 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 like embarrassingly one being daddy daycare the um eddie murphy <laughs> Eddie Murphy movie like yeah that 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 got me and I was like kind of had to look myself in the mirror and go like oh, what what are you doing like so, <laughs> it's, so, like a I, of, it's a form of social Darwinism isn't it and once you all become parents yeah. then it's it's like you, you suddenly you're doing things that no self-respecting person would ever do <laughs> so I enjoyed it on that like like it got me on that level so like that's probably but that's probably cheating but like putting that to one side I like visually. I really, I, I really enjoyed it. It's really like visually exciting, and um, it's it's happy to like be quiet in moments. Like there are mm. whole there are whole moments where there is no dialogue, and it just mm. like visually tells the story. It lets the animation do its work, whether it's these sequences, because it is it is your classic like A to B plot mm. line of. I, yeah i guess like land like almost like land before tight like or homeward bound that kind of we need yeah. to seek refuge somewhere we don't like we don't know where that really is in this it's kind of this figurative thing of let's go to the sun and like <laughs> let's go to the sun well that was actually one of the things that i so so i i i, I guess i should say um, sort of ahead of everything I'm about to say. Um, I actually know a couple of the people who worked on this movie. And not only that, but I've had the pleasure of working with them, you know? So uh, this was produced by uh, Jane Hartwell, who was was producer on Ugly Dolls. Um, uh, two of the story uh, artists and story consultants were Paul McAvoy, who's my head of story on Ugly Dolls, and my current movie I'm doing with Netflix right now, Wendell and Wild, and uh, and Rob Briggs, who I also worked with on Ugly Dolls. And the head of story was another story artist I worked with on Ugly Dolls called Ed Gomber, who's just an absolute legend, <laughs> uh, veteran of, of of animation. He's he's got stories up the wazoo, probably few of whom you know, few of them are, are, are good to print. But um, <laughs> um, uh, what's interesting about it is that. Uh, Paul McAvoy was saying that when he first read the initial draft, like most animated movies change hugely as they go through production, you know, like uh, inevitably. But he said that the, the initial pitch for this movie was so fascinating to him because uh, it, like in its essence, there was a character who was this spy character who his, his mission in the first plot was that he just wanted to walk on the sun. And, and, wow. and Paul said like, that's just an amazing idea. And just a lovely, lovely thing to, to to consider. And even though that that part of his character pretty much changed into like, oh, we're going to go find tomorrow, it became more abstract. Um, 
the the imagery of the sun, the imagery of using your hand to to, to see the sunlight on it yeah. and to, to be guided by it, to follow the light, um, uh, endured through all of the different story changes and stuff. Well, it's pretty interesting to talk about like the story of this. Actually, was yeah, you you said like it was written by uh, Kirk D'Amico and um, none other than John Cleese. Yes, which is I like. Know amazing so like, i did a bit of digging as to where that kind of like where this kind of came from and D'Amico and cleese were actually working on a um adaptation of roll dolls the twits wouldn't you have killed just to watch that oh that would have been amazing i'm hoping like with this new netflix deal that they kind of have with the roll doll properties with i know they have like taika watiti working on like a couple of like pieces for it that Mm-hmm. In that, the Twits kind of gets some kind, yeah, gets the justice it deserves. I mean, like Netflix has been making so many good decisions <laughs> when it comes to animation recently, and just in general. I mean, like um, right now, Netflix animation has been snapping up all the directors it can and asking them what what their passion project is. You know what I mean? Like, and they've been. <laughs> I, I sort of described it to someone the other day. Netflix has been making decisions like two stoners uh, on a on a couch. Yeah, so, yeah, like you know, it'd be really good. Dark Crystal sequel, and it's like ten episodes, full puppets. Like, 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 like <laughs> shit that you never thought anyone would actually put money behind. But they're like, you know what? It'd be great. Henry Selleck hasn't made anything in ages. Let's just give the Caroline guy <laughs> whatever he wants to just make his his dream project. And that's what I'm working on now. Like, they're really slaying dragons when it comes to giving audiences what they didn't even know they wanted because they didn't know it was a possibility. So yeah, that's exciting as well. I would love to see the Twits. But... Well, yeah, they've even like, <coughs> even like as recent as um, the Midnight Gospel, they've got like Pe- uh, Pendleton Ward's new like animated series, uh, the creator of Adventure Time. And it's like, they, and uh, yeah, it's a lot more geared up to adults. So they're like, great. Like we could see that he kind of, teetered on the precipice of making all these adult jokes in an adventure time let's just let him go like no holds barred netflix yeah so like it's yeah netflix is doing amazing stuff with animation that paradigm is a paradigm that even now in the isolation we're we're experiencing like they're starting to realize the power of viewing on demand but also with netflix so like you know a movie like ugly dolls come can come out and have an underwhelming opening weekend and then be all the articles on cartoon brew and other places are like what went wrong with ugly dolls and like how did ugly dolls fail whereas netflix can release can just drop a film and they never have to publish their viewing stats unless they want to brag about them. So <laughs> even if people don't watch it in droves, at least the word of mouth of that particular project gets to be actual word of mouth of people just sharing it and talking about scenes that they love and tweeting about their actual feelings of watching it. Whereas like, I think there's an emphasis, especially in the world of animation now, of being like, okay, it has to gross this much money, it has to have this much of an opening, opening weekend. Right now, um, they had to release Trolls World Tour on uh, on v- VOD yeah, 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 because of the coronavirus. And it made a huge pile of money. It basically just like cleaned up, maybe even more so than it would have if it came out in the cinema. So now there's a war going on between cinema chains and Universal because Universal said, we're considering maybe releasing some of our movies just as streaming, you know? Uh, and, and, and so two industries are now intensely fighting because one <laughs> was thinking we might be dying <laughs> um yeah like so back well with the crudes um yeah. what like nicholas cage obviously isn't the only star name in this like the the cast is amazing right like yeah i mean the the cast let's be honest here the cast is probably too good for, for, for an animated movie like it's catherine yeah. keener that's that's like this is I think Catherine Keener's first animated role um, yeah. before she was in The Incredibles two and it's like Catherine Keener's too good for this part like <laughs> it, it, she 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 adds bits of realism to Ugger that are like entirely just because she's Catherine Keener and yeah. that's like a, a testament to the director casting really interesting people like Emma Stone was a star but she wasn't like Oscar winner Emma Stone at that point and all of the cast I thought did a pretty damn good job. Yeah, so we also have like Ryan Reynolds in there as Guy and uh, Clark Duke as Funk. So like, again, like even like we had, this wasn't Ryan Reynolds as we know him now. This was kind of 
like he was probably limping off of the like failure of green lantern at this point as opposed to the kind of riding high severing heads of deadpool and like yeah. middle finger up to the camera like but it's just interesting and like even like yeah Catherine keener because like when i think of nicholas cage and Catherine keener all i think about is adaptation oh adaptation <laughs> yeah, i totally forgot about that it's such a good film but also it's like okay so so you're talking about like reynolds like reynolds probably at that time was licking his wounds and it's kind of funny that his name his character name is guy it's quite witty because he's a caveman yeah. like they don't have very good naming uh sort of ideas but 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 at that point, really, Ryan Reynolds, to me, was just, in any movie, I figured his name was just Guy. Gosh, He's just yeah. a guy <laughs> um, who has some easy charms and stuff. But when you think about it, like, when it comes to getting actors to be in your movie, um, it's pretty much a no-lose scenario if you're an actor to be in animation. Because, I mean, when you think about it, like, you know, there are high stakes for all the people making the animation, but no animated movie has ever ruined an actor's career. You know, like, like Patrick Stewart was literally a walking, talking pile of poop in the Emoji movie. <laughs> and he's still, dirty, he's still fine. He's still Picard. Like, like um, animation is, is just a low, it, it's a low risk investment for you as an actor. You get to show up in a room, usually just by yourself, have a bit of fun, letting loose. Um, and, and then they get you back over and over again as the story gets reworked. And, and so you get to be in an animated movie, they give you a pile of money, and then you get, like you were saying, like, uh, you, you're a new father. A lot of actors get to, you know, even if the movie doesn't do well, like, they've got a, 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 a movie to show their kids where they're a cartoon character, you know? There's, so so it's, it, there's really no reason why any actor would turn down an animated movie. It's just fun. And so, so it, it, it makes choosing the actors that you want to have in that animated movie a question of what kind of movie you want to make because you know uh blake shelton could have been grug you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> like nick jonas could have been grug and 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 they went with cage they wanted this uh eccentric idiosyncratic bunch of character actors to breathe more life into these uh, characters than was necessarily there on the page well yeah that's the that's one of the things like especially around this time in uh like anime like yeah 2013 you would have had like a lot of um a lot of like sequels whether it's like one of the later uh ice age or something yeah. like that and a lot of those cash in on like you like a like you were saying like a pop star name just to bring people in whereas like having these character actors in this gives the film real heart like and i'm not sure how this did like, i could d double check how this did kind of commercially in comparison to like though like those films at the time if you it is interesting the story of um what dreamworks was going through at the time dreamworks had laid off a considerable number of its animation workforce the same year that the crudes came out oh, wow. they were afraid um because their uh, rise of the guardians and a couple of other movies that they'd uh, put a lot of money into had failed <coughs> and um uh, so uh disney animation uh, no, sorry, uh, DreamWorks Animation uh, laid off uh, a bunch of its workers. Um, and the Croods, I think, actually did better than they uh, had anticipated and perhaps saved the studio from bankruptcy. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a, different, uh, a different time for DreamWorks. Like, they, they were looking some serious financial woes uh, in the eye at that time. Yeah, it's got like a considerable, like net profit is con considered to be uh, 100 and, uh, uh, 106 point five million dollars so like mm. that's a consider and it was the 13th the 11th highest grossing film of 2013 and there's mm. just in like the stakes of animation it was quite like a heavy year like yeah. this was this was frozen like mm. this was, do you know what I mean like which is like probably adorns the walls of like many a like child like this was the height of John Laster's tenure at Disney this was like him, him reaching peak uh, yeah. last year at Disney. And, and it, it's funny how you mentioned like um, uh, uh, the state of animation at the time, because it's like, so DreamWorks has a certain modus operandi when it comes to animation, which is Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks comprise what I like to call like the big three in animation, you know? Uh, so in comics, you've got DC and Marvel and then smaller uh, yeah. uh, companies uh, like Vertigo and stuff like that. And then, and then with animation, you've got DreamWorks, Disney, Pixar, 
and then a bunch of smaller companies like Blue Sky and Illumination that are very much about um, uh, keeping costs low, hiring people who wear multiple hats, and then they're, they're, they make a lot more profit because they, they've controlled how much money they, they, they spent. So DreamWorks and, and, uh, is, is interesting because it has certain movies that fit more the Blue Sky Illumination mode, like something like Boss Baby or something like Captain Underpants, where they will make something that's a smaller movie. Uh, yeah. Stylistically, artistically, it is, it is designed to be a money spinner. Um, because Pixar could release a movie like The Good Dinosaur, which made $400 million, but just because Pixar spent so much money on its movies, and that movie had such a long gestation period, that was considered Pixar's first financial disappointment, <laughs> $400 million. So that's how crazy animation is. So DreamWorks should be lauded because it sort of hits a compromise between making smaller movies that are more uh, profitable just by the basis of being cost-cutting. And then it also every now and again makes franchises like Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, and The Croods, where they put a bit more um, money into just making something that's absolutely stunning to watch. Like you can tell a lot of money ended up on that screen in The Croods. I mean, you, you're right, it's a stunning movie uh, on a visual level. And just like, uh, so, so um, I, I, I'd say The Croods is really solidly in the middle between does sort of the high watermark of something like How to Train Your Dragon and then like the lower strata of DreamWorks animation fair. Well, yeah, I've always been like a massive fan of like animated films. And I'm like kind of disappointed that I let this one like sl slip me by for so long. And it's kind of maybe without this kind of journey I'm going on watching every Cage film, or I imagine I probably would have eventually watched it anyway, having a child, but like, at some <laughs> point. <laughs> but like, um, yeah. That's a good question, actually. I was going to ask, did you watch this for the first time have, have you not watched this before i'd never watched this before no 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 and like wow. i was very like yeah i'm kind of i'm so glad i did because like i guess to talk about like things like just the character design on the crudes themselves but then this kind of like landscape they're put in and these kind of like menagerie of like interesting like and fascinating like otherworldly prehistoric creatures that like just kind of like interesting and fun plays just like visually and kind of like yeah just aesthetically pleasing looking whether it's like a leopard spotted woolly mammoth that just looks oh, yeah. like it looks looks beautiful and just like the textures on the furs and stuff like that mm. and um it's probably a weird thing to talk about in animation but like the camera movements it like i get like, i wanted to talk about that yeah. i wanted to you're absolutely right the the um so in animation in stop motion, obviously, you're filming something with a yeah. real camera. So, so an awful lot of real filmmaking brio goes into lenses and and camera moves and cranes and dolly shots because you basically have to cre recreate what a camera move is, but on a yeah. smaller scale. Whereas in animation, um, it's called layout. So before, um, like like probably a hundred people uh, have to get their fingerprints on one wow. shot of animation before it ends up in the cinema. It's like. From from my first few scratchy doodles uh, <laughs> on a tablet doing a storyboard, uh, then redrafted a hundred times. Then it gets um, uh, all the assets are made digitally. So if there's only so many assets you can afford, obviously they had a ton of assets on this movie. Yeah. It's just absolutely like shock a block. It's almost like uh, uh, Disney's um, Alice in Wonderland for just how much story uh, is, is 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 built around world building and, yeah. and incredible character designs, creature designs. But like, so layout is 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 when they take all those assets and create the camera move before all the animation is put on, before all the textures and the lighting is put on. And so, um, I often get frustrated when I see shots of mine in movies. Um, uh, like uh, like on, on 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 Ugly Dolls, there are times when I'm like, that's not what I drew. Like, like, and, and someone on layout who was doing his own camera move and trying to translate what I do. Some story artists put a lot more work into trying to show what the camera move is going to be than others. And I love seeing how the camera moves. This movie, they did a couple of really excellent things. One thing is that they employed handheld. They employed the illusion of it being a real camera. Yeah. Like it, it wasn't just swooping around organically, like, like something that couldn't be real. I mean, they did the same thing in How to Train Your Dragon with the flying shots because they would actually add wind shake to the camera as though you were as though it was strapped to a helicopter following <laughs> this freaking dragon. But um, um, they did one other amazing thing. So 
a visual consultant for this movie and the Half Stranger Dragon movies was none other than uh, cinematographer legend Roger Deakins. This yeah. is the guy who, 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 you know, he lends the Oscar winning 1917, you know, uh, Blade Runner 2049, most of the Coen Brothers movies. They got him on um, around the same time that he also consulted for Pixar on WALL-E. And, and, and he basically treated all of the digital cinematography crew to like a Deacon's tutorial. He gave them like uh, the full Deacon's as it were. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so consequently, like there are scenes in the crews like where Eep is following that little patch of light, like yeah. it's, she's a cat with a laser dart, you know what I mean? And then going out and finding all those embers and, and like that is lit like, like, like no country for old men. You know what I mean? It's lit like, <laughs> it's lit like, um, like, uh, like a Coen Brothers movie. And it's, it's stunning because a lot of things um, that, that I find irritating about a lot of uh, more mainstream animated, more commercially minded animated movies is that because they're trying to sell toys, toys of the characters, toys of ugly dolls, toys of, 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 of any product really. Yeah. Like, the lighting is often very sterilized and like they overlight because it's like a pack shot for a commercial. You're trying to show yeah. them at their most colorful and poppy because you're trying to sell a bunch of trolls. And in the crudes, it's grubby, the characters are hairy, you can see every follicle on Gru's face, they are scratched up, they're, 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 there's dust everywhere, light streams through the dust. It is a cinematic experience to watch the crudes. And I think on, 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 on a visual level, it just is peerless to me. Well, yeah, on that thing you, you mentioned about like marketability of like like toy tie-ins and stuff like that, this doesn't, this don't like, that this seems like this was the the, the furthest thing from their minds because like, yeah you're not gonna like sell a lot of grands are you you know <laughs> <laughs> like the only the only thing i could kind of see is yeah maybe like the like the animals but like that's hmm. like by the by like the actual like family themselves and like it's something again that like is just great character design like hmm. you notice these kind of like big scar down grug's nose and stuff like that and it's just like it's stuff like that that, like, I don't know, uh, brings you in, brings you into this, like, the story and just, like, I don't know, you get these great, great moments and, like, just visual, like, slapstick humour in this as well. Is yeah. like, well, it's a lived-in world, isn't it, you know? There's a, there's a sequence um, that I've got in my notes known as, uh, I've written it down as the snake belt uh, sequence, where we have... Um, <laughs> Grug is trying to become a like the, the the kind of thrust of this film is just a very like well, it's, got, it's a very modern like thing of an older generation worrying that they're going to be taken over by the yes. the young the younger generation which the upstarts, I guess, yeah yeah ev every every parent every person in industry any technical revolution everybody kind of has that very real fear that yeah before the long and the, the 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 need to in, to embrace change you will literally become a caveman whether that is Pretty, the, yeah, exactly, the, absolutely. The, the, the digital age and yeah he as well put man he has this moment where he is like right that's it i'm going to become <laughs> a blue sky thinker i'm going to come up I love with this <laughs> all of these like ideas of how how i can like innovate for the future and um he's like dawned a like snake as a belt that's like self-tightening and we get this like amazing performance from cage we get like, oh it's one of the three most cagey bits of the movie go yeah, ahead do he, it. Rock he, it. He, he, he kind of like when when the belt like tightens up he's like it's self-tightening <laughs> so he, get, he gets the like almost almost ape elvis in like we know it's something that like cage loves to do anyway but like we get like a like these brilliant moments and yeah to slapstick we get like him tr like falling about with these like new ideas like i call this one like the mobile home and we get like interactions with like the creatures and he gets like flat and then i i love the fact in this that even though we see quite early on with stuff like this that that he, he almost seems like he's invincible and there's no yeah. peril for this character. Yeah. When it eventually gets to moments where there is like, like senses of dread where like, yeah. there's a moment that's very com yeah. comparable to the uh, toy story free um, conveyor mm. belt scene. Oh, obviously yes. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. it's like yeah them stuck in like uh some kind of molten ooze quicksand you oh, do yeah. like you are there going like oh shit this 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 could be it and more to that point like when grog kind of has his farewells of his family as he throws yeah. them over a ravine to tomorrow yeah you get this real lump in your throat in that it's like oh he could actually he could actually dot he could be extinct he could have even though he's accepted this change into like he wants to accept the new world yeah, yeah that irregardless he's going to be left behind to die with the with the old world which is just yeah. like well, it, i was it, like fuck it's pretty powerful i mean like and and, and you touch upon something that, that that you mentioned earlier which is absolutely right which is that every now and again the movie slows down like the moment when him and guy are stuck in the tar and then the moment where he's saying goodbye um and throwing all of his family members one by one like they spend a lot more time on that ending than you expect because animated movies tend to wrap up really fast and and uh so so I want to talk about uh, the story structure of this movie a little yeah, bit. Because yeah. A, that is my, as is my want, this is yeah, my job. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, all I do when I watch movies yeah. these days, especially animated movies, is I, I dissect the story and me and my girlfriend brainstorm it a lot. But like, <laughs> um, but, but, but one thing that's interesting is I'm, I'm wondering how you perceived the movie through what I know about the movie and how it was made. But like, um, this is a movie that, that, that was um, uh, uh, put through several different iterations right um before it got to the version you see and so consequently you see ideas uh that were generated for several different versions of the movie that have been put together and sewn up into what you now see um ed gombert the head of story you know said that he he cared very much about trying to get the story dynamics right but um uh then that they were often trying to fight to to incorporate these two different versions of the story. So originally, when it started out, it was playing with that uh, concept you you mentioned, which is uh, the idea of um, uh, Plato's fable of the cave. You know, the idea of people having mental limitations, both uh, physical and and psychological. That that some people want to stay indoors, and the other people, uh, it's convention versus curiosity. Um, okay, I got to I got to ask you on a tangent. Because this yeah. is something I've been dying to ask you since everyone. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, sorry. I, 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 we will we will get back on story in a moment, yeah, but I have no. to ask you this question. <laughs> okay, how differently did you view the opening of this movie in a post COVID nineteen world? Oh yeah, yeah. The that that the movie is like Grug wants to keep his family safe and inside the cave and Eep wants nothing more than to swan about outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he's telling you, and like, and we literally established in the really witty opening, like, narration, that all of the other families they know have been picked off by different predators and the common coal. <laughs> and, and so, like, I was watching it and I just started sweating. <laughs> Like, I was like, oh, my God, this is literally my life right now. I am Grug in the cave. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly, like, when, when this movie first came out in 2013, I was like, you're supposed to root for Eep. You are really on her side when she's, like, trying to get out and see the light and, and, and have a live, live an adventure. But now, through the prism of where we are, I'm like, my God, what a spoil, entitled brat. She's gonna have she's gonna get her whole family killed just so she can hang out with the yeah. sun. This oh. girl needs some talking to. She should get grounded. And there's that bit later on in the movie where she's like, where she's like, you know, that wasn't living, that was just not dying. And it just reminded me of like the idiots in America right now who have been like protesting in different yeah. states, yeah. trying to get the, the states reopened, and they're just there sharing the coronavirus with each other, like continuing like this sort of Darwin Awards. Um, uh, that, that is now very literal in the crudes, and I'm just like, oh my god, what did you think of that? Because I got so anxious watching it. Well, it was like it's this thing. I think it really like firms the the kind of messages of the film, like mm. even further. It's this kind of like millennial versus uh, boomer thing. Like in one end, in essence of this kind of you don't understand each other, but it also has this kind of thing of yeah, like you were saying, the kind of what is it generation z like the <laughs> like, exactly that, yeah. that versus that versus the like millennials of this thing it's of like, like generation oh, jurassic and generation yeah. cretaceous you know? <laughs> yeah and it's 
that I, I I I can't help but find a lot of links with like what's going on currently. Like even even yeah. going back to Astro Boy, like it's set in a dystopian future where there's a disparity between wealth uh, between the rich and the poor. Like yeah. the world has become basically a uh, sh- like mass garbage dump, and people have isolated themselves on a um, floating island above above the planet. And yeah. we have a scene in that of a like a parent really trying to like desperately homeschool their child and all i could think was wow this is like the coronavirus or or yeah like a slight tangent but talking about like mandy i couldn't help but watching it going oh it's about a hillbilly in the woods who's like getting people drugged up and like a part of a cult that's really like tiger king and it's just like all these kind of like benchmarks of like what's happening right now yeah, like, the the, the it, path to fatherhood is 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 basically can be separated into two chapters there's <laughs> when you watch the road for fun and when you watch the road as like a how-to manual yes. for protecting your children um and, and it's so funny because like you you say that you've got a um a, a one-year-old mazel tov, that's so great um and that must be such an amazing emotional thing to suddenly watch animated movies like children are such sponges and, and you you see how important and yeah. what a great privilege it is to work in animation because you are reaching children right at their most impressionable but but what's interesting is that i um, my girlfriend has children and i watched uh, the crudes this time uh the second time i'd seen it uh with her son xander and it's like uh that there were moments when you know drug learns to be a, a good dad and where he sacrifices himself where i felt really bonded to xander we were just there yeah. like like we we're both getting emotional and stuff like the bit at the end where like you know story wise because i've watched enough like i've had my ten thousand hours of watching <laughs> you know that when he says his first line at the beginning like never not be afraid you know that that line is going to come back yes and that it's going to be the reverse that's that's just story 101 so i knew that line was coming and even still nicholas cage just you know he 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 sold it. He, he slayed me with that line. I want Nicolas Cage to whisper, never be afraid before throwing me over a giant. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, and, and like that is a, um, uh, an insight into just, you know, like we're talking about Cage being untethered, you know, like being allowed to cut loose. That was a great bit of subtle work from him. You know, where he, you know, uh, Emma Stone, he, you know, he matched her toe to toe really when it came to, to that sequence. And okay, so, so yeah, it, it is a brutal world. Um, and and you're right. Like you mentioned, a, a dystopian future. This is like a dystopian past. Film. Yes, yes. And and there's like there's bits that are really savage and brutal where they get away with a lot of Tex Avery humor, like the grandmother almost wanting to eat her own grandson. Yeah, and yeah. and like there's there's literally a tracking shot that tracks through the carcass of a bird as it is being eviscerated from the inside <laughs> by the by the crudes while they're eating it, like like freaking chainsaws. And and um you're watching it going like, oh my God, this is actually like a really harsh world. That They actually push it right to the edge of what censors would probably want, right? For, 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 for parents uh, wanting to watch a movie with their children. There's a, there's a sustained comedic and dramatic sense of threat throughout the Tom movie, which is quite brave for an animated movie. And, and I was watching it thinking, um, the thing I was thinking about earlier about the, the COVID thing, which is that like, I was like, when I first watched it, I was, I was supporting Eve. The second time I watched it now, I was supporting Grug. And I realized that is the perfect foundation for good drama, which is that there's actually a legitimate reason, a valid reason why Grug is the way he is. Yeah. So, so good drama, as I've defined it from constantly you know, consuming these movies, is like good drama is someone making the wrong decisions for the right reasons. And, and, and bad drama is someone making all the right decisions for boring reasons. So, so, so if you take the story dynamics of Eep and Grug, they actually have, they have to meet in the middle. It's a, they, they actually have to compromise because you can't just say no to danger. Like you can't just like ignore yeah. danger. But at the same time, like, like at the end, her arc is to say I'm scared, you know, at the end. And then his arc is to say never be afraid. And so it's like, yeah, like it, it, the story dynamics of the beginning and the end are, 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 are really effective. But I'm going to talk a little bit about story now. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so, yeah. so, 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 because it sounds like you really, really enjoyed um, a lot of the gags, right? In this movie, this movie is wall to wall a gag machine. Yeah, I love the gags. I kind of love, like, like, love the set pieces. Like, there's a, yeah. there's the uh, right, like chasing away from this kind of prehistoric tiger sequence where they 
Mm. All jump on t- top of like this woolly mammoth that's like yeah great like all stuff like that. I even just like enjoyed these these moments of them traveling, kind of just set to like the brilliant um, is it um, Alan Silvestri score? Alan Silvestri, yeah, absolutely. Like, is, who worked on Lilo and Stitch with Chris Sanders? Yeah, and then is obviously the creator of the well, the composer for the the Avengers theme. Like, yes. so like and Back to the Future. Like yeah, this yeah. is the Back to the Future guy. Yeah. Um and and yeah, so so what's interesting is that there's actually a reason why um the movie is as visually off the chain as it is. This is rooted in how the movie's production uh worked out. So originally you were right, like originally they were gonna make this as a stop motion movie with Ard Man animation with John Cleese. Right. Oh, wow. So, so there was a period around the time of Chicken Run where Aardman had like a five movie deal with DreamWorks. Yes. So DreamWorks yes. was going to distribute Aardman movies. So, The Crudes was one of the concepts that John Cleese and John D'Amico were given because they were going to make the twits. They said, hey, do you want to look at some of our other projects? Um, uh, uh, have a look at this. So, Cleese and John D'Amico wrote a bunch of drafts of this story. And that story, the original story of The Crudes, had no family. The family were in it, but they were not in it throughout the whole of the movie. It was just Grug and Guy. And it was that struggle between convention and curiosity. It was about a set in his ways caveman and an inventor caveman who was like, who could see possibility and he wanted to walk on the sun. And so it was, as described by Ed Gombert to me, it was planes, trains, and automobiles. Amazing. In prehistoric times. It was them going on a road movie to, to, and, and bickering all the way. And so that's a really cool thing because you can see that bits of that, like them getting stuck in the tar, are obviously yeah. vestigial parts of that original story. But um, so what happened was, was that uh, uh, Cleese eventually like, moved on, uh, the, the art man... Uh, a studio passed on it and, and eventually it got re- reverted back to DreamWorks and they started developing it. Interestingly, Aardman then made a stop motion caveman movie. Yeah, early uh, Yeah, Which I've not seen, but like, it's interesting to see how these things shake out. Like obviously people like, you know, have a lot of institutional memory <laughs> when it comes to animation. <laughs> but um, um, so they were working on this movie um, Chris Sanders was brought in to rewrite it, um, you know, uh, because he'd done such great stuff with Lilo and Stitch and things. And then they got their team together. They started working on the story. And then halfway through, um, as happens in animation, there's a lot of director changes in projects. A lot of people get replaced, like stories, like you're at the whim of, of an executive who has a yeah. vision of something. Like these things that happen all the time. And, and so the directors of uh, How to Train Your Dragon needed to be replaced and a new creative team has to be put in. So How to Train Your Dragon was originally really close to the book, but that just didn't make a good animated movie. So they got Chris Sanders to reunite with his Lilo and Stitch uh, collaborator, and he left the crews to go work on How to Train Your Dragon. But instead of shutting down How to Train Your Dragon, Jane Hartwell and the other producers kept a, a skeleton crew of the story department and the art department going in this hiatus. So the, the writer, John D'Amico, kept writing drafts and, and Paul McAvoy, uh, Rob Briggs, Ed Gombert, and a bunch of other really talented story guys just spent a couple, like, like a, 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 this, this sort of like wilderness period developing story and character ideas. And at the same time, the art department and the production department just started slaying dragons, creating all those creatures yeah. that you see in the movie. You'll notice there's, a, there's, there's more assets in that movie, like, and by assets I mean individual character yeah, yeah, designs yeah. and creatures and plants and things, than you see in your average movie. It's like they just, it's, it's like the, they're burning through budget. Um, but it's because, it's because they had this massive incubation period while Sanders was away in which they just went all out creating a world. And then the story department just did sequence after sequence after sequence filled with gag. Consequently, my criticism of the crudes, uh, I, I don't know if you can call it a criticism because it's one of its strongest assets, <laughs> is, is, is that uh, it's got a really effective lean opening and a really emotional lean ending. Yep. And then the middle like hour, it's like an hour 38, the middle hour is just 
um, in story we call it the fun, the, the fun and games portion of the film. Yeah. Which is like the beginning of the second act, you've entered the new world and you, you get to play around with the promise of the premise. So, so, so the cruise just has a massively flabby middle filled with every single creature and yep. adventure gag that they could possibly throw at you. And it's because of this abundance of storytelling brio that they had built up. Chris Sanders came back and started rewriting it and, 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 and got back on the project. But it, 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 consequently, there are, there are bits of that movie where they, they just throw the kitchen sink at you. There's even, so there are so many gags in the middle of this movie that there's literally a banana peel gag. Like that's, that's how much you're scraping the bottom of the barrel there. Well, there's even time for like self-aware stuff. Like uh, there's one moment that like really stood out to me and it's almost like, it felt like a uh, one for Cage in that him and Guy, are, uh, so Guy devises mm. these many different ways of how to like, uh, using inventions and stuff like that to mm. capture animals or distract mm. them. Whereas like the crudes are very much rudimentary one person distracts, one person runs in, grabs the grabs the egg from a, from a chicken. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very, 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 very caveman esque. Uh, I love the family kill circle. That's a great. Yes. Gag. It's, just so, <laughs> it's so I don't know how they managed to get that <laughs> on the census. Yeah, never leave the family kill circle. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's this moment when he's devised this kind of uh, it's like this chicken like yeah uh, kind of puppet. For them to control and they're kind of behind this rock and um grug just like says to him he's like give me the acting stick. hand me those yeah oh no this is okay so this is a moment that that like uh, i was uh, i was holding on to because like so we're uh, like i said we're going to be reviewing this as an animated movie and we're going to be reviewing this as a cage <laughs> yeah, movie. yeah yeah We've... In, a, in a good nicholas cage movie requires that he give you at least a couple moments, like a cage out moment. Oh yeah, of like, course. You yeah. cage out. And, and um, me and my brother Steve, uh, he he does the fifty uh, uses for the word love podcast. You know, he, we often say that like when I go see a Tom Cruise movie, I want at least one cruise gasm, or, or else it's an unsuccessful <laughs> cruise movie. He waited until the last second of Valkyrie to give me a cruise gasm, <laughs> and I never forgot it. But there was this moment. <laughs> there's this moment, like that moment where where where. Guy is trying to act this puppet. It's utter Tex Avery surrealism. It's just yeah. this is the gag guys on the movie just going overtime. But but there's that bit. You're right. He says scared. I'll show you scared. Hand me those acting sticks <laughs> like that. He, and then and then proceeds to like wig out with the puppet. And for me, if ever there was a mantra for Nicolas Cage, it is hand me those acting yep. sticks. It just manages to be both funny in situ, but also utterly like a statement on Cage's own appeal. Well, and yes, his, it's, it's a know. very good like meta gag in that like, it's one that like plays to the parents, but not in this kind of alluding or to anything like I don't, modern technology or mm. innuendo. It is just like very throwaway as well. It's funny in its own right as you said, but like, if you kind of know Cage and what he is like, what he is famous for, especially up until this point, it's like, that's yeah. a real one for the oh, it's, it's vintage. It's vintage. Yeah, yeah, like, like, it's, it's, mm, oh, butterfly kiss. It's so good. And, and, and it's funny because like, <laughs> you cast a character like Nick Cage, you know, um, DreamWorks used to make, you know, they, um, they rose to glory on the back of Shrek, which yes. is incredibly pop culture referential. And then for a while, DreamWorks did things like Shark Tale, which were like super, super, almost irritatingly referential, right? And then they, they, they pushed the boat out a little bit with Kung Fu Panda, which, was, which had that back in it, but was trying to do a proper Wushu Kung Fu movie. Yeah. You know? And so the, the, they basically realized that, hey, we can, we can actually make a movie that feels more like a Pixar movie with a bit of our DreamWorks sensibilities. And so the idea that you have Nicolas Cage in a movie, but he doesn't say something like, you know, I'm going to take that McCornivore's face off you know he doesn't he doesn't have a moment that's 100 percent. but like yeah um that moment just like really sells the appeal because every cage fan is just going to be like that's him talking about himself <laughs> and um okay so so talking about gags did you like the middle act because so what did you think of the movie structurally structurally i agree with you in that it does kind of have this like whip smart like just like 
quick opening that mm. kind of it sets all the pieces in play very quickly and kind of yeah. you know you know where you are straight away mm. um and yeah that as as i've already said like that ending like it got me it like it just like yeah. kind of it's it's got it gets you where you're going man yeah it, it like it just kind of like it's like a knife to the heart of, oh this is actually really like this is it sideswiped me that I like I this is gonna do that. Like, I've got this image of you literally with your one-year-old baby throwing him over a crevasse. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, I love you. Never be afraid. Did someone pick up my baby. <laughs> so then like that middle I I, to, I I totally understand your point that it is it does have this like flabby middle and like but I think I just kind of let myself go with it, like because I kind of enjoyed the world and I like just I like the characters and I like I like the vi- the visual stuff of like the family mm. on stilts and kind of like without without using words just kind of you can see yeah. the disdain that Grug has for Guy and just like yeah. you have yeah the moment you talked about with them all eating this like chicken <laughs> carcass and then story time where like we kind of really boils down the the counterposing points of Grug and Guy when yeah. uh, they essentially tell the same story but Grug's is very like it boils down his point of his is a cautionary tale yeah always. fear yeah. fear ends fear. with death yeah. yeah 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 whereas like Guy's is like his is always Bangkok dangerous <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very it's very optimistic do you know what I mean it's, it's, very, it's very woo woo it's, it's like oh and then we then we float until tomorrow and it's like it's that is yeah it's it's it's, it's all like that so like I enjoy, I enjoyed the middle section but yeah I do yeah. I, I, yeah I think you're right I you you hit the nail on the head when you said it was just flat out entertaining like it, it, it's like airplane the sheer yeah. number of gags per minute per second is so high and the art direction and the, the creativity on display uh, like even stuff like that that saber tooth tiger you mentioned that the green saber tooth tiger that's like colored like a parrot was just yeah. like one of the art directors was just playing around with one of the drawings of a saber tooth tiger was bored and colored it like a parakeet and then it developed into this whole thing about every creature you see on screen is a chimera that doesn't exist in nature. Just like the, the the strangeness of being like, hey, we're gonna do a prehistoric movie that's gonna have nothing to do with reality. We're gonna live in our own stylized world and we're just gonna go all out with the visuals. Like they went to uh, they went to this incredible, uh, they went to Zion National Park in Utah to look at rock formations. They, like so much of this movie yeah. is just, is gorgeous. But like, so, so, so gag wise, you know that bit where he says, hand me the acting stage, yes. right? So it's like, this touches upon something that I've always thought about film, which is like filmmaking is a magic trick and animation is like the best version of a magic trick. Oh yeah, of course. So magical. In fact, it's a magic trick that once you know how they did it, it's all, it's more magical. That's, that's, that's how beautiful it is. Usually magic f- disappears when, when it becomes, but like, but if there's one thing I would describe Cage as, as the performer, like, especially when he says, hand me those acting sticks, is like other people might use those acting sticks better than him. You know, other people might be, might be more consistent with the acting tricks. Other people might be better at the magic trick than he is. But he will always entertain the fuck out of you. Oh, like, definitely. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Like, like, other people might do it more consistently, but he he's a magician. And, a, like, a magician has to be skilled at what he does, but he has to be a showman to be a true act. And Cage is just a great showman, an MVP of, like all these gag artists throwing everything at you. And like my criticism of the middle act of the movie is just like, it's like, um, I think it's just that it gets repetitious. It's like, okay, so they, they, they throw stuff at each other a lot. And then it's like, okay, he resents group, uh, guy, he resents guy, he resents guy. And then he tries to kill guy, he tries to kill guy, he tries to kill guy. And it's, after a while, it just sort of piles up. And, and, and so the same beat gets, gets underscored so many times that you feel like, I wish that they could, could have had some of the brevity of the first and the third act. But at the same time, <laughs> there's a bit where they're riding a giant cob of corn, where it's a bit like, okay, I think they jumped the shark for me. That one maybe could have seen the bottom of the story, Scrappy. You know, like, the, like we, we could have maybe cut a little bit of, of, of that. I mean, like, there's even a freaking weirdly niche V for Vendetta reference, did you mention? No, no, no. 
when the copper corn flies up into the sky and bursts into popcorn like a firework, you hear da, 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 da. you hear Tchaikovsky's yeah. 1812 <laughs> overture. And I'm like, did I just watch a repeat of the gag in this movie? <laughs> My God, they let the story guys run rampant. Like there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, 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 it justifies its existence because you just enjoy being the, the foundation is so strong. Right? Well, yeah, they mess around with like they mess around with scale as well. Like their their relation into like the animals that populate this kind of world is like obviously a saber toothed tiger you would expect to be the size of like a, a, a tiger now, but like mm. they are massive in comparison and it just like all of that just makes it like visually visually really exciting and like yeah. i'm just yeah i probably we should probably mention the fact that this has had like kind of a time like a sequel that's supposed to have like mm. come out and it seems to have had like a very like tumestuous like well that's interesting mate i mean like you're talking about you're talking about the nature of animation right yes. now because like <laughs> the funny thing is is like uh Crude One was no different. You know, Crude One yeah. was on hiatus. Like, Crude One was originally going to be an Art Man movie. These movies go through so many, like, these movies regenerate, like Doctor Who. They, 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 they have so many faces. And, and what's interesting about the process is that I mentioned, like, in animation movie stars, you get, you get a truckload of money and then you go into a room and record. Yeah, yeah. They record all the way through the story process. Like, we, we have temp dialogue that we record while we're doing the initial ones, but as the movie gets more serious, we get the stars and we start like, like uh, recording them. There are probably, I bet you, five entire movies of Croods 2 with Nicolas Cage's voice that exist somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Right, the, 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 and, and we'll only see one of them when it finally comes out, apparently this year or maybe next <laughs> year. But it's like, that movie's already gone through a couple of iterations. Like, I guarantee you that they've already got Emma Stone and Catherine Keener and uh, Kat Dennings and, and Leslie Mann and all these other amazing actors that are apparently in the movie. Like, there's, there's B-roll of all of those characters. Yeah, like uh, the, the idea for the, the, the sequel sounds, sounds good that like, the focus this time will be on Ugga, so Catherine Keener will get her chance to shine like from oh, i didn't know that i love that from what i've read yeah it's 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 gonna explore motherhood and it's gonna be the first chapter in society like expanding on like the 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 first film being the last chapter of the caveman mm. and then um leslie mann and uh her daughter like kat dennings would play her daughter called dawn um nice and they would kind of be like a rival family in this new 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 way of life and it's kind of sounds like the perfect like idea of what where this could go next then that this this hmm, almost, society yes or or, or just the, that'll catch on in about 10 <laughs> billion years <laughs> or just this idea that like i don't know the kind of family dynamic in this just like ha like harkens like reminiscent of like just just your classic like tv sitcom like family sitcoms almost like a um married with children like you've kind of got this overbearing like patriarchal figure who's just kind of like Hmm. at odds with his family all the time and like yeah just just to i would love i would i yeah i'll say it now I, I really want this sequel to happen i don't think it will happen this year even it just seems hmm. to be like pushed back and pushed back and yeah it's, it's, i think what i can read here is it's supposed to be delayed until the 23rd of december this year but i can easily see that going to next year yeah, and, and the, the balls are, are all up in the air, not just in whether or not, at what time it will come out, but also what, what medium it will come out in. Will it yes. come out in theatres or will it come out as a streaming service? Like, you, 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 who knows at, at, at this rate? I mean, like, it's interesting. You talk about, like, the, the sort of slightly more conventional framing of a family with a patriarchal figure. Um, me and my girlfriend like to uh, diagnose uh, animation story yeah. formulas because, like, every animation studio has its own kind of formula. And uh, we kind of crystallized it down to like five basic stories that always get used in animation. And so there's stuff like there and back again is the most obvious. It's like a Pixar Quest movie, basically. Um, that you know, like you've got to get somewhere, and and you know, the lesson learned is the is the ticket home, essentially. Yeah. And then you've got stuff like Kindred Spirits Against the World, like Lilo and Stitch, or E.T. You know, you've got Into a New World, which is stuff like Ugly Dolls, or like Trolls, or like anything where a character comes into a a, a new environment, and he either changes that environment, or the environment changes them. 
And then you've got stuff like the benevolent catalyst, you know, um, uh, where the main character doesn't have an arc, but everyone else around them does have an arc. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's so much fun to geek out over these things. But like, <laughs> if I were to diagnose the crudes, I'd say it was, we stick together, which is the, 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 the formula for, there's a familial um, uh, dynamic that's at play here. And all the relationships are discordant at the beginning, but it's a relationship that should be strong. Yes. We know should be strong. And so they face forces that try to pull them apart um, from like the external and the internal. And then, you know, they spend the first two acts becoming more distant from each other. And then it gets, re- you know, resolved in the final act and they, they, they come back stronger. So um, that's a, a tried and tested method. It's like the incredible. It's like you, you put a family on screen. Um, but what's interesting is that that family didn't show up until several drafts into this movie. Yeah. So, so originally it was Guy and Grug trying to get Grug back home to his village. So they established the family in the first act and they show up at the end. But they realized that, like, um, uh, this is what Rob Briggs told me when I, I, I emailed him. They realized that uh, after a while, you really got sick of Grug complaining about Guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 it was funny at first, but then just got really thin by the end. So they just did not have enough planes, trains, and automobiles to, to, to sustain the whole movie. And they realized that they really loved Grug for wanting to protect his family at all costs. And then they thought, okay, well, then they changed the, the reference point. They're like, let's make it Little Miss Sunshine. Um, Little Miss Sunshine in prehistoric times. The family all have to go along too. They put a real threat, which is just like their their home is going to be completely obliterated by this yeah. tectonic shift. So they push them on this adventure altogether, and then it changes. And consequently, the movie is like a movie of two halves, like but it's two halves running concurrently. So there's like yeah. Grug and Guy, and then there's Eat and Grug. Grug yeah. And uh, as as Ed Gombert said to me, it was like they couldn't figure out whether it was planes, trains, and automobiles or Father of the Bride. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so, and so, like, it, it even, like, it even, like... Uh, uh, Someone was on a real big, like, Steve Martin kick, I guess. Oh, mate, no. I mean, like, we were on Ugly Dolls and we had an executive turn to us and be like, yeah, can you make it like Revenge of the Nerds? Like, th- th- there are so many uh, moments in, um, in an executive's mind which come from the 80s. Apparently, that's where most of the executives were, like, at their formative years. <laughs> Their reference points are from the 80s and we're like oh yeah yeah sure we'll do that great um but um uh, um consequently at the beginning you know there are those beautiful bits where Eve is like looking at the sun and stuff yes. and she enters out you can see some of that storytelling confusion of the two versions being laid over each other because it mm-hmm. starts the movie starts like it's going to be her story and then by the end really it's Grug's arc completely yeah he he ends up changing. He ends up throwing them over the ravine, and then it's him alone at the end, having his idea with the saber toothed tiger. And so it's like you can see that this was a movie that that that, that was one thing, and then turned into another thing, and then turned into oddly enough a chimera <laughs> like <laughs> the creatures. Yeah. But but it's still for all of like the moments that I could pick apart the story dynamics of it. It's such a beautiful chimera, such a beautifully designed, amusing like endlessly creative chimera that it works well yeah it could have easily have just fallen on that kind of arc of um guy and Eep, like the 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 love story between them but like yeah. i love the fact that it is a love story between a father and a daughter and like just a, a father and his like his love for his family like like mm. she happens to be the prism that that is shown through the most because she is the one who is obviously the furthest away from like already being in the bosom of the family she's the one like pushing against it all Mm. but like yeah it's i i I kind of had a slight eye roll when i was like oh this is just going to be about like this is going to get sidelined with this kind of love story between Ypres and guy and then i was pleasantly surprised when it wasn't like i was Mm. like oh this is great like i was scared like it was going to be family in the first act and then it would be family trying to maybe find uh, Eper and uh, like guy, something happens. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm. And and they're kind of separated. Whereas, like you saying about the uh, Little Miss Sunshine, like that's that's beautiful. Like, I think that's such like a great, like amazing thing. And I guess a lot of people won't know that. Like, obviously, people in animation, these are going to be their reference points, uh, yeah. reference points to make. That they're gonna they do watch other types of films. It's not just going to be 
Oh, let's try and make it like that other anime. We're all children at heart. We're all like, we're all just guys in film school. Like, <laughs> we're all just there. We all want the Dark Crystal 10 parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Puppets. Like, we're all that guy at the water cooler or the guy on the couch, like, just like wake and baking, thinking about like, what, what would people want to see that, 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 I mean, this touches upon something that's so kind of weirdly like emotional for me, which is like, okay, so I worked on like the first movie I worked on was not a, a critical, you know, success, you know, um, it was ugly dolls and it was, it was, it was, you know, it kind of came and went, you know what I mean? Um, and, and I think the audience were kind of wise to what it was trying to do, you know, like, I mean, movie audiences are so literate now. They're so, uh, savvy and and so unless you really have a, a, a really winning hand like it's hard to to corner a market when 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 you're trying to create a, a tentpole franchise you know um and and now i'm working on the other end of the spectrum with uh with henry selick on, on on his you know his first project in about 10 years um with netflix and and key and peel which is like i don't know <laughs> like i mean the, for all the sort of like, you know, for, for all of my bad luck working on Ugly Dolls in terms of just like the frustration we felt constantly trying to get that movie to fruition, the head of story on Ugly Dolls was also the head of story on Wonder Wild. So without Ugly Dolls, I wouldn't be where I am right yeah. now. So I'm always going to look at it with love. But it touches upon something that I had to work on a big Hollywood movie to understand, which is that like, one of the things I love about your podcast, mate, is that like you will go to town on a bad Nicolas Cage movie. But at the same time, you do it with an awful lot of love and an awful lot of understanding that like, do you know what? Nobody goes into any movie, no matter what level of Hollywood, like trying to make a bad movie. Oh, yeah, we're, all, we're all movie fans. And all the people who like cast Cage in terrible movies probably grew up loving The Rock. You know, like I, he was my like, when I first watched The Rock, you talk about Bayhammer, right? <laughs> My God, the most unrealistic part of that movie is that Nicolas Cage has a giant apartment and a girlfriend with pigtails who desperately wants to marry him. Like, that is, like, true. This movie's not realistic. But I loved it. And, like, 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 like he, he's, he's a huge pillar of a lot of film fans, like, experience of the 90s. Like, you know, from, from, from Nerdy Cage to Villain Cage in The Rock, where it's, like... That's like his best role. And, and, and he's only the villain for 10 minutes in that movie, you know, before he changes faces with John Travolta. Okay, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my favorite Nick Cage performance, hands down, is Nicolas Cage as Caster Troy. Not even Nicolas Cage as Sean Archer. Nicolas Cage as Caster Troy. And I wish that he played more villains because he was, that was like the height of Cage for me because he had more fun in that 10 minute opening sequence that you, you don't even think of John Travolta as anything other than that character. You think of him as Caster Troy from that opening 10 yep. minutes. That's how good he is in that movie. And then like Con Air, like where you just go full beefcake cage. Like he, he had the full trifecta of goofy action movie. He could be the nerd, he could be the villain, and he could be the sort of cheesy uh, um, hero. And, and, and a lot of the people who now make movies, you know, they love Jeff Goldblum. They love... Um, uh, they love uh, Nick Cage. I mean, John Travolta's career is oddly enough followed a similar trajectory. They like both of them right now. It's fifty fifty if it's going to be a good movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, well, yeah, I think I think Travolta. Like the last film I heard him starring in was a uh, tale of a like obsessed stalker. And yes, it was directed by. It looks dire. Gerst. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was written and directed by Fred Durst of Limp Biscuit. So I'm not sure if that is uh, a mark. I mean, like, part, of it, like, part of me feels like I could make it a masterpiece. <laughs> but, but, like it's weird. It's like sometimes these actors go into these weird periods where it's like I, um, both Travolta and Cage have something that I like to call the the the, the hair theory, which is uh, that um, my theory. I, I have no scientific backing for this whatsoever but you probably know better than i do wait wait, wait before you get, scholar. But yeah before you before you go into this like, there's actually three questions i ask everyone oh yeah go um, for it and it, no no actually you go with your point because it doesn't really apply yeah. for this film because it's it's actually cages well, i'd be curious cages. to hear it anyway but but like first i'll i'll, I'll finish what i was going to say and then yeah, like yeah. by all means ask me because we'll figure yeah. it out like like i mean i'll i'll happily um uh, yeah. uh play ball because it's like i could talk about cage as much as i could talk about animation <laughs> um so so i have this theory which is the hair theory which is that um i think that if um if cage's hair is short odds are it's going to be a good movie right his the quality of the movie correlates to the length of his hair 
And it's the same for John Travolta. When they have short hair, then like, like if Cage has short hair, short hair, it's going to be something like Lord of War, Matchstick Men, anytime Oliver Stone's cast him in something. And if he has long hair, odds are it's going to be a fucking train wreck. It's going to be like uh, next, Bangkok Dangerous, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, whatever. Like it's going to be, it's going to be really risible Cage. And then if his hair is mid, if his hair is like a medium cut, it's probably going to be okay. You know what I mean? It's going to be like national treasure, bad lieutenant. Like, like he'll be, he'll be like, he'll be passable. And and weirdly, that happened with Travolta too, which is like, I I, I don't know if like the barber or his stylist that he works with reads his <laughs> script before he's like, oh, oh, what's it, what's it called? Bangkok Dangerous. Oh, okay. I, I think we'll get you some extensions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'm actually working on yeah, like a three point system of trying to figure out like empirically like what makes a kind of like a cage film good or bad on this weird scale that doesn't apply for the crudes because it's animated, but it is. Just well, a- I don't necessarily think like, like let, let's see the criteria and I'll see if I can, I'll see if I can tailor so, it. So, so, so what, one of them is like, the first one is, does he have bad hair? Hmm. Like, does he have unequivocally bad hair? Obviously like we, we don't know. Cause like Grug is, is, is a, is but we can thing. speak for the character design. Grog has yes. definitely got bad hair. Yes. So we can answer that as a yes, as an affirmative. Um, does Cage do a crazy voice? Like, does he have a mad voice? Uh, I, I always like to use the example of, like, you think of a classic Cage crazy voice mm. of Vampire's Kiss when he's kind yeah. of yeah. doing this, like, where the hell is he from? Or do we get, like, is he doing something interesting with his voice? Because a lot of the time, like, if you watch, like, a Next or a Pay the Ghost, yeah. he's just kind of doing this what's going on oh my god like, man they're doing this kind of um sub keanu reeves subconscious it's like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a, there, i mean like I, I don't know if you covered in 2001 his first animated vocal performance was in a christmas carol which was like a i think it might have been a made for tv kind of animation but it was like simon callow as scrooge nicholas cage as marley i don't know if you've seen him in that but oh my god i'd sounds- always planned to do that as a christmas special and then <laughs> i ended up like I think never got around to it. But you I mean, can find only his scenes on YouTube and that's all you need to watch. Amazing. Just, I mean, yeah. He sounds like he has been tranquilized. He is <laughs> just like, and it's like Marley, he's playing freaking Marley's ghost. And if ever there was a character for Cage to be pun intended, unchained. Yes. Is Marley's ghost. <laughs> but he's like, oh, Ebenezer. He just sounds like, literally sounds like someone slipped something into his brain. He, he, I, I, I'm ninety percent sure he was buzzed when he was when he was doing that recording. But no, um, so yeah, no. Does he do a funny voice? I direct you to the aforementioned acting stick. Yes. And then the final and third question of this like three point thing is, um, do we get a cage freak out? Do we get a cage like? Do we, mm. Does he freak out at any moment? Which is I think that's that, like the entire duration of this movie. Yes. yes. <laughs> So I guess it does tick those boxes, but yeah, yeah. like it, it, it's weird because like I mentioned before, this is the beginning of that era of referential cage. This is the beginning of people casting cage because he's Nicholas Cage. Well, they, yeah, this, this is a very interesting decade for cage. The kind of 2000 to 2020 um, makes up for half of the movies in his whole career and oh, it's a 30 year career so like he just really picked like it was, yeah he was going pretty fast anyway but all of a sudden he just like kicked in he drove angry up to like 100 miles an hour throughout those years and it's, it's almost like yeah you almost want him to team up with Takashi Mike because they yes. like, both of those guys they know how to freaking produce like <laughs> they're producing like they got like 10 minutes to live you know yeah so um yeah before i let you go um David, uh, where like where can people like keep up to date with what you're doing? Because you do these amazing kind of breakdowns of animated films on Twitter, right? These, uh, yeah. You don't mind talking a little bit? About oh yeah, that sure. Well, <laughs> well, that's funny because like I was talking about how like uh, you know no one in this business is trying to make a bad movie. Like one of the things that I always want to do is I want to be able to analyze the, uh, the 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 industry that I'm in. And that's one of the reasons why I'm glad that you asked me to do this podcast because it was an opportunity to dissect something, but lovingly, yeah. 
that I know people who were involved in it. I'm fans of people who were involved in it, but also I didn't have anything to do with it. So I get to just enjoy uh, uh, like putting my story hat on and just sort of like dissecting it. But um, so recently I don't have like uh, I don't have a, a podcast. I, I've guested on a bunch of uh uh, some of your friends' podcasts, uh, <laughs> Sparklight uh, um, and uh, Sudden Double Deep and The Bitter End. I know you had Todd Jordan on. Yes. Uh, uh, he's fantastic, and that was a great episode too. <laughs> um, uh, so so what, um, you don't get a lot of time to work uh, uh, on anything outside of your job when you're a story artist because, man, it's some crazy hours. And, and we're, we're one of the few uh, industries right now that's still going because yeah. so much of our work can be done remotely. And, and I, I'm, I'm talking to you from Des Moines, Iowa, not even Burbank or, <laughs> or wherever uh, the, the studio is. <laughs> I actually uh, made my girlfriend laugh uh, the other day. Oh, she, she laughed bitterly, but it was like, um, uh, I was like, I think I had just gotten consumed with coronavirus news and I was talking about, hey, I just trimmed my beard because they say you've got to get up and get into your clothes every day and just try and act like you're in a normal day and just don't let the depression get you. And she just looked at me like, you work remotely from home and you never go out. Nothing in your life has changed. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? You don't even trim your beard. This is insane. I was like, yeah, but I can't go to the pub. It's like, you go to the pub like twice every six months. And I'm like, yeah, but now I know I can't, can't. even if I want to. It's like, you know, she was like, you have first world problems on top of first world problems. <laughs> um, I was like, okay, hoisted on my own for time. But um, uh, so, so, um, one thing I've been doing recently is, as you say, I've been, uh, I just decided I don't really have a desire to work for Disney animation. I mean, like, I uh, love what they do, but like, uh, not in, like my career goal, but not one of the big three. Um, but I felt like now Disney Plus is up and I've got a lot more, like everyone's got a lot more time. Yeah. I felt like I want to be a scholar of the industry I'm in. And I just realized I hadn't fully watched every Disney movie. So I just set myself a challenge to watch every single one of them that had been like, even the live action animation hybrids, you know, like, um, like, you know, like, like some of the, like even the package movies and the propaganda movies they yeah. made in the 1940s and things. And I just set myself this crazy challenge and just started doing tweet threads, reviewing them. And like for no real reason other than to just amuse myself and for my mates. And I've gotten a really great response and, and I've done about five of them so far. And, and, and like, I was amazed at how much they ballooned because like the last one I did was, was Dumbo and I didn't even think I had a lot to say about Dumbo, but it ended up being like a hundred tweets long. And I was like, what, why did I do this? Like it's, I've got 40 films left and I got all in on Dumbo. What the well, I, I, I think that especially that time in the, the Disney like history, it's quite interesting culturally, a lot of those films and I went like Dumbo, especially like uh, not to obviously yeah, like not to get bogged down in something too heavy, but like a lot of lot of like race issues. Oh, yes. A lot of early dis and yeah, a lot I just, to unpack there. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, yeah, are you do you have any plans to talk about uh I, I think it's the only one of the only films that's not actually on Disney Plus. You're it's, talking about Song of the South. The South, yeah. I watched it and I will be talking about it. Oh man, yeah, yeah. I like weird, weirdly, it wasn't till like last year, I kind of had to reevaluate that film because I I remember owning that on uh, VHS as a kid. Mm. Uh, like uh, I listened to like a four part um, or like six part like podcast series called um, uh, Think, uh, Things you, Things You Should Know. Mm. Um, like kind of these Hollywood like breakdowns. So they do like amazing stuff on like uh, Charles Manson or like and his like role in Hollywood. Oh, that's cool. But like, yeah, there was a there was a whole season on um, the Song of the South, and it was listening to that, and I kind of I I had these like glimmers for years. Of this I remember it being like weirdly icky, but like at the same time, I remember Zippity Doodah was a banger mm -hmm. in my head. Yeah, no, it is, it is a banger. It's like a, a it's crazy. I mean, like, and, and and my memory of it was really just that song. Yeah. Like, I it it, it 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 occupied this weird syrupy haze. Yeah. in like my six-year-old self that, that, that had no impression of what I didn't know, I didn't know. And that's like, that's probably going to be what I find most interesting about dissecting it is that like reading about how, what Walt's thought process was when he was making it and how he even tried to hire someone who told him not to make it. He hired that guy to write it. He yes. said, if, if anyone's going to make this better, it's going to be you. And then he ended up throwing out a lot of that guy's ideas. <laughs> and it's like, 
but it, it always comes back to like nobody wants to make a bad movie and and uh, one of the things that i've become incredibly passionate about recently and one of the reasons why i've had a lot to say about disney's classic era is because i read a book called the queens of animation which is about uh the unsung and often completely left out sort of legacies of some of the women like the first story artists some of the first animators who were women in disney's golden age and when you get to things like uh, the black centaurette who was cut out of Fantasia being this sort of servile, almost slave-like yeah. uh, affectation. And then you get to things like Song of the South, you get to the crows in Dumbo. Like you realize the importance of diversity within our industry, the importance of having people in the room who have different experiences to that of being a white cisgendered male, which is what I am. And, and, and so understanding that, understanding that, that there are things that I will never know, I don't know unless I surround myself with other incredibly talented people. Um, um, that's probably why I really, that's, I, weirdly, the, the more uncomfortable parts of reviewing these Disney movies has actually been my favorite part of doing these tweet threads. Because, because there's nothing wrong with saying that you love when I see an elephant fly and, and actually love the, the, the way the crows fit into the story because they are a high point of Dumbo for me, but they're also intensely problematic. Yes. And just to be able to acknowledge it, it's okay to acknowledge it. It's okay to talk about it because that's how we move them forward. And uh, you mentioned Song of the South, man. Um, <laughs> Song of the South, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to be working on a movie which is being done with Jordan Peele and Keegan-Michael Key. And they, you know, like, you can't watch Song of the South without immediately thinking about their magical Negro sketch where yep. the two magical Negroes come in and start like throwing hexes at each other and like, <laughs> and you know, the animated bird like has laser vision. It's freaking epic. <laughs> and it's like, we're, we're living in a different age now and yeah. people who were, who, who were once, you know, a slave to whatever representation people just put on them are now in charge of like, they've got the mic. And so that's an interesting time to yeah. be working in film. And it's an interesting time to be working with, like I said, animation which is like aimed at the most malleable impressionable minds because it starts with representation if you establish something as being normal to a child it's normal forever it's like oh people of different colors people of different sexualities people of different gender identities yeah. you can you can create representation that 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 doesn't change someone's worldview it can invent someone's yeah. world and that's a, that's a high responsibility, even though we're just silly gag writers and, you know, so much of it's crazy and stressful and silly. But, like, there's something really beautiful about that. And uh, writing those tweets, uh, those tweet threads has been a part of that and me almost trying to hold myself to a mark sometimes. You know? uh, amazing. Where can people, yeah, where can people find that? Like, what's your Twitter handle? Um, uh, my, my, I believe my Twitter handle is at drumble. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea why I picked that name. I think, I think back when I was problematic myself, I thought it would be my rapper name. <laughs> so, <laughs> G Rumble, yeah, yeah, spin that shit. Um, but now I'm, now that's pretty much all I do. All I do is guest on podcasts and talk about animation whenever I'm not um, on a deadline. Perfect. Well, just in case you have got a deadline to get back to, David, this uh, feels like a perfect, perfect place to leave the conversation. Like leave the conversation here. Yeah, I've had a great time, mate. This, this was been, absolutely this was a blast, mate. The pleasure's been all mine. This has been so 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 fun. Always a pleasure to geek out over something, especially Cage, man. I really appreciate <laughs> it.